This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 485 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, Total Saddle Fit, and the United States Dressage Federation. For today's installment of the USDF episode, we are going to start with an update from Kathy Robertson. Then Michael Bragdell will join us to talk about the USDF Sport Horse Prospect Development Forum. And we will be joined by WEG Dressage Team Alternate, Olivia Lagoy welts Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Rockwood, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. Hi, Phil. <laughs> Hi, Reese. How are you? <laughs> I am great. It's been wow. a bit of a busy day around here, but okay. it's all good. We have the Retired Racehorse Project going on That's here. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my Facebook has been uh, updating it's me. With all, yeah, all kinds of people are there. I mean, this thing is getting really it's huge, getting isn't huge. it? huge. There's over 900 horses there this, oh my this, God. for this show. It's huge. There's, I think, 10 different disciplines. They're all over the horse park. And so I was up in the – the dressage was in the Rolex or the main stadium, the big stadium at the horse park. Yeah. And yeah. it was it, it was great. I mean, I, I saw some maybe not such great horses, but I would say overall I saw some really nice horses. I was Fantastic. really impressed. Yes, yes. Uh, one of the horse, one of the ladies I helped, Joni Morris, she won the eventing dressage today, so that was pretty cool. And um, the open dressage, I think there's like 180 entries or something. It's still going. Well, you know, thoroughbreds yeah. make great dressage horses too. You know, I've, yeah. I learned them thoroughbreds you know um, uh, yeah absolutely re- retired race horses and they're fantastic and um, it, this is cool. just such a great program you know yep uh, absolutely it's great well, and we'll it's in the best all... place right you know yeah, right around I think so. all the thoroughbred <laughs> farms and i mean whoever came up with this idea when it started it's just a genius thing it, should it, be it is it is a really cool thing and, and it's really big i mean there's there's so many people in from all over the country it's in it's incredible and from so... our country yeah, I, know, I, I have to too. give we'll have to give a shout out to Stuart Pittman because he was the one that started it, and it was years ago we had him on when it was just an idea, and I think the first year they maybe had fifty to a hundred horses. It wasn't a lot. It was in Maryland at the inside of a racetrack. Uh, they okay. did it on the infield of a racetrack. It, you know, then it eventually got bigger, and they had to move. Mm-hmm. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's really cool. So uh, it was a great day. So we'll try and we'll try and get somebody on. Like I said, the dressage is still going on all day tomorrow. So we'll 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 snag try to get somebody who who rode and, and did really well. So really fun to, you know, fun to to watch and, and see. So it's that was pretty cool. But we have some really amazing news. And this just came out that the Olympic bronze medalist duo and America's sweethearts, Laura Graves and Verdadis, also known as Diddy, have topped the FEI world ranking list this week, um, which is amazing. Uh, they are the first American partnership to be ranked number one in the world in history. So that <laughs> was pretty amazing. They took home the silver medal the Grand Prix special at WEG, also the silver medal team medal. Um, so really, really cool. And and my heart just is exploding for Laura. That is amazing. So that's pretty fun. Isabel Worth has been in that yeah. spot for two years. Yes, <laughs> two years. I know. I mean, Isabel's pretty amazing. She she showed us all how it was done at, at WEG. It was it was awesome. You think she's saying, who's this whippersnapper from America coming in? Taking this <laughs> oh, I think she, <laughs> No, they've been going back and forth for a little yeah. while. Oh, yeah. yeah, she knows who she is. Everybody knows who she is. It just. I think now, I think now they've been duking it out. I think now, you know, I, I think Israel's uh, probably going to a few more competitions here shortly, but uh, it, it's pretty awesome. So congratulations to Laura. That's amazing. It just gives you goosebumps for sure. So. And we have some other news, huh, Glenn, from the Olympic Training Center. What's going on there? Yes, we do. The, the It's really cool, and this doesn't happen mm-hmm. too often. The United States team, the United States Olympic team, the Team USA, 
does awards every month for athletes from all over the Olympic world, not just horses. And this month, though, there are four different horse th- people and groups in the voting. So you can go vote right now. I'll post it on the Dressage Radio Show. I did already on the Dressage Radio Show Facebook page. And in the female category, we have two equestrians. We have That's Laura amazing. Graves, obviously. We just talked about her, right? <laughs> and, but we also yes. have Rebecca Hart, who won two medals at WAG in the para competition and has been a, re- a regular on our shows for 10 years. Uh, yeah, super amazing. sweet, super nice. We got to hang out with her at WAG, and she's just so nice. And, you know, she actually works, what interesting story about her, she works for Starbucks, and they have been huge supporters of hers for the last several years. They give her all the time off she needs. They help support her. So yep. uh, kudos and she, to Starbucks. She works, though. She, yep. you'll see her at, at five o'clock in the morning in the Wellington Starbucks. She's yep. amazing. She's she's a worker bee. She's amazing. And uh, so she's in there. So those two are in the. Uh, so it's going to be tough in the female. They got to pick one of those mm-hmm. two. And then in the male competition, McLean Ward's in there because obviously he did he did he did a few things over there at WAG. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then in the men, or in the team competition. Of course, the U.S. jumping teams in there after their gold. So, and they're up against indoor volleyball. So, who cares, right? And then also the <laughs> Women's World Cup basketball team. Who cares about that? So, go vote for the jumping team there too. So, yeah. I, as I understand, you can vote once in each category. Is that correct, Reese? I, I did it. Yeah, yeah, I voted, and and it was really it was really easy. So, um, yeah, go vote. It's and awesome. we put the link there so you can go vote. Mm-hmm. And it's not often we yeah. get in this. Uh, no. In <laughs> TeamUSA.org, I think you yes. want to be yeah, going that's to. Right. Yeah. Getting, getting those riders represented in in the in the Olympic organization. You know, and you know, there's always there's been talk, and there still is talk of taking the horse sports out of Olympics. And I think if we can get some of them voted up. Uh, mm-hmm. That will help our case. So agreed. Yep. Get in, get in there, everybody, and vote. Well, well, guys, we have a a really great show. Actually, a pretty long show. So we'll we'll get right to it, and we're going to start with Kathy Robertson for our USDF monthly update. Well, we are really excited to have Kathy Robertson, Education Department Manager, on from USDF, and our best speaker. How are you, Kathy? I'm good. I am glad to be back. I know it's our it's our USTF segment or show of the month. We're super happy to have you, and there is so much going on. We felt like we needed to have you back. So tell us what's going on. Well, we we do have a lot going on both um, within USDF and the dressage community as a whole. I did want to before we get into some of the programs. I did want to remind everybody that um, there are some new rule changes. Um, that are being proposed for dressage. Some are going to become effective on 12-1, and I would encourage everybody to go to the USEF website, review the rule changes. There are an opportunity to provide feedback, and I would encourage anyone who had some feedback that they want to discuss to come to the annual convention. We'll have an open um, forum where there'll be an opportunity to discuss those rule changes. What I find is that sometimes nobody pays attention to the rule changes until they're already a rule, and then we get a lot of feedback that we probably should have had before it was an yeah, approved rule. Yeah, it's too late. Yeah. You know, once it's, it's been implemented, yeah. the, the input it's process is sort of over and done with, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and Kathy, if you really... can't, oh, I'm sorry, if you can't make it to the to the convention, you can actually send an email because I I'm a I, I'm a delegate, right? You can send an email to someone like myself in your region, and we can bring yes. it up. Correct? That is yes. correct. There is a that process. Is correct. How would you kind find of, kind of a proxy thing? Yeah. Yeah. How would you find those people on the website? Like, if you somebody wanted, you could contact me if you were from Region Two. Uh, but how would you find people to do that? If you go to our website, I believe that information is on the governance page. You do have to be logged in to your USDF account, and then you'll be able to find your delegates on the governance page. Right. So that's coming up, too. And and feel free to – that's what we're here for. So please feel free to contact people. Excellent. And so tell us about conventions since we're sort of on that topic. Tell us about that. We do have convention coming up. It is November 28th through December 1st. It is in Salt Lake City, Utah. We're pretty excited to be going there. We have a lot of great things going on. We have a um, a lot of education that's going to be happening throughout the week. Of course, one of the big topics will be the new tests 
that are become that will be coming out both for freestyle and for the technical tests. We have will have um, a panel of um, uh, judges talking about the pyramid of training and how it relates to those tests. So trying to try, tie the training and the tests together. We've also got a panel that's going to be focused on young horses and competition and when it's good to compete and when it's not good to compete. Um, I'm pretty excited about that panel. We're going to have Christine Traurig, Lisa Wilcox, and Lilo Four um, sitting on that particular panel. We're also going to have a discussion on arena footing. We have a session on on, uh, human emergencies and how to handle uh, an emergency with a human if there's a fall or um, you know, when to call 911 and what can you do um, in the meantime. So we're pretty excited about all of that. Um, of course, we have our, our Board of Governors meeting. That's going to be happening on Friday afternoon and Saturday morning. So if you want to come and learn about the business of USDF, that is the place to go. We are going to be electing some new officers this year. So as you had mentioned before, Reese, if anybody has any feedback on rule change or any of the governance of USDF or any questions, they need to go to the website, find out who their delegates are, and contact them so that the delegates can bring that information forward to the governance meetings during our convention. Fantastic. Um, but the biggest thing we have coming up right in front of us, of course, is the U.S. Dressage Finals. Regional championships are going on right now. So if you um, need to be nominated or declared or need to get your um, information in, I would remind everybody to check what the due dates are for your regions and don't miss those deadlines. We are excited to be back here in Kentucky with that and looking forward to a good competition. Yeah, I know it's coming up so fast. It's it's going to be a lot of fun. Our regionals are next week here here at the horse park, so I get lucky. Yeah. I don't I don't have to. We don't have to travel, which is nice this no. year. It's just yeah. really nice. So looking forward to that. I love it. And so again, the, all that information is on the U.S. Dressage Finals webpage, right? If you need, it to. is. It Excellent. is. Good. And then we have some other programs. Oh, we have a lot of other programs. Um, <laughs> That's not it. Up, sure. Now, now, uh, the, now uh, you know why Kathy's here. Yeah, exactly. Coming up on October 21st and 22nd, we have our Sport Horse Prospect Development Forum. Again, that is our program that is geared specifically to three-year-olds and helping them transition from their work in, and training in hand to understand all and into the competition arena. We're really excited to have Scott Hassler back for that, along with Michael Bragdell. And I think you'd mentioned Michael's going to be on later to um, talk about that program. So we are very excited for that. Pre-auditor registration for that program closes on Friday, but we will be taking registrations on site for anybody who wants to register at the door. That is going to be at Sonnenberg Farm in Sherwood, Oregon. It's the first time we've been up in that area with this program, and we're pretty excited to be there. The big thing we have, we just recently announced our um, FEI Level Trainers Conference. We are going to be back in Florida And we are very fortunate that we will have all of the U.S. dressage coaches coming to the conference. They'll be together in one location for the first time as a group. And and we are very excited to have them join us for that event. Oh, fantastic. When is that, Kathy? That is going to be January 21st and January 22nd. Awesome. It's it's a good time to head a little bit south, isn't it? (laughs) <laughs> it is time. Yes, it will be in Wellington. Um, we're excited to be back there. Along with that particular program, as most people know, we are um, in the process of transitioning licensed officials' education over to USDF. And just before the conference, we're going to be hosting a continuing education in judging musical freestyle program and a judges forum. So we are going to be in Florida for about five or six days having some very targeted and specific education to a variety of groups. And they can go to the website for all of that information. Love it. Love it. My goodness. There's so, see, again, there's so much going on. 
Mm-hmm. And the best way too to to get news, right, is the is the Facebook page and the check the check the website as all these programs are coming on. Yeah, we're we're doing a lot on social media. Um, so there's Facebook, there's Twitter, um, there might even be some stuff out on Instagram. I'm not sure. I don't really do Instagram, <laughs> um, but you can always go to the website, and all of our information is always on the website. Members need to also keep an eye out for their uh, e-newses that come in through the email. We generally, that's the best place to get the most current and updated information is through their e-news. Awesome. I love it. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. How do our listeners contact you or anybody at the office that they have questions on these programs? Uh, They can find me at krobertson at usdf.org. If I can't answer your question, I will know who to direct you to, or they can go to the website at www.usdf.org. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. Thank you for having me back. The sun is just peeking above the tree line as you walk into the barn. You grab your horse's halter off the hook and head out to the field. The dew shimmers in the sun as you walk across the damp grass. You call his name and his head comes up as he walks toward you looking for the apple in your pocket. You take your time grooming, enjoying the peace and quiet in the empty barn. A refreshing breeze greets you as you start down the tree-lined path. Your horse ambles along on a loose rein as you both enjoy a relaxing ride. The feeling you get on an early morning hack is why we do what we do at Kentucky Performance Products. This feeling is brought to you by Microphase. Fill the nutritional gaps in your horse's diet. Microphase vitamin and mineral supplement is a low calorie way to provide your horse with the vitamins and minerals missing from their diet. The horse that matters to you matters to us. Well, tonight we are so happy to have Michael Bragdell. He is a presenter at the USDF Sport Horse Prospect Development Forum, which is going to be October 20th through 21st in Sherwood, Oregon. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Reese. Thanks for having me. Well, we are so happy to have you back, and we are we are equally as excited about this program. So, tell us all a little bit about what's going to what um, you and Scott Hassel will be talking about in Oregon in a couple weeks. Well, I think what we're trying to do is is make a connection between the the young horses once they've sort of finished their sport um, their in hand part of their life to becoming a riding horse and then bridging it to some of the young horse classes. Fantastic. So, I mean, that is a huge jump. Obviously, you're not riding. Well, in some of the young horse classes, you're you, in hand, you're riding. Some of you're not. So that's a huge jump. So kind of what are you guys, how are you going to show that? Well, we what we want to do is basically, we don't want to tell people what they're doing is necessarily wrong or or but we want to help them in a way and give them tips and how we would train the horses along and get them started. And the process of once they are started on the saddle, those first few steps uh, with some easy exercises for the three and four year olds, it's, it's in some ways very basic, but I think it's important pieces for the horses that are in that stage of their life. Yeah, I mean, in my own experience in starting horses, you know, you've got to come up with a lot of creative plans because they don't all follow a formula, right? You can't always do, you know, one thing that works for one horse doesn't always work for another horse and, you know, and that kind of thing. So I think in my own education over the years and with young horse programs and, and people, you know, learning from people who are really good with young horses is that you need a lot of tools, a lot of different ideas on on achieving hopefully the same goal which is you know getting on the horse's back and going around and walk chalk canter in a pre- in, you know in kind of a safe and simple manner so i think like you said you're not you're not there to tell people there's this way or that way to do it it's just like here's some different ideas and and that's what i really you know i enjoy talking to people who start young horses as as well as myself 
because we get to exchange ideas and, you know, and come up with different exactly, plans yeah. for, the, oh, well, I had this horse that was, you know, we usually, you know, we're always talking about breeding with young horse. I had this quarterback mare that this really worked for her. And, and I think that's such an interesting part. And, uh, I'm always really passionate about these things. That's why I really love these young horse forums. And we get, I get to talk to people who have a lot of experience and I get to share my own experiences. So that's kind of fun. Yeah, and I, you know, exactly. I mean, I think it's important to to share information and uh, help other trainers to continue to further their education. And I just, I think Scott and I are both on the same page, and and we worked with Willie last year in sharing our information, um, sharing our knowledge, and passing it on to other people. And you know, hopefully, they will as well be able to gain some more experience and knowledge from from coming to to the forum so will you guys be using demonstration horses or videos or you know what is the how how is the what's the plan so we we've got quite a few applications for it and and uh, it's been exciting to to look through and and we we try to have a good variety of horses you know it's not that i necessarily want to have horses that are just perfect. I mean, that's, that's in some ways makes it a little bit too easy. I want to have horses that had a variety of challenges um, that are common issues that we are going to encounter when we are working with horses in that age range, three to four. And we've been lucky in the, the group that we have here, we've had a lot of three-year-olds apply, which is great. Um, that's, that's perfect for the forum. That's what we really want. Uh, there is some four-year-olds in there as well, but uh, I think it's going to be an exciting group of horses. Uh, they're all from that region, that area, so um, yeah, it'll be very exciting. Well, I think that's so cool. You know, I may may see one or two three-year-olds a year. Between you and Scott, you guys do so many more. Your volume that that's you guys are, are at Hilltop, and you do so many, so many more horses. So I think that's what's cool to learn and to be part of what you're doing. Cause I look at a three-year-old and think, okay, you know, my, my toolbox isn't that deep. Yours is much deeper, yeah. <laughs> which is so cool to watch you. And you're so comfortable with that age range. Um, and I think that's really what people are going to see when they see you work with horses. It's just, it's a phenomenal use of your knowledge and your confidence with those horses. So are, are people going to ride them or, or are you going to do all in hand or how's that going to work? Yeah, so each each rider comes with their own horse, and they will it will basically be an under saddle clinic format. Um, so Scott and I will sort of tag team and do what we've done in the past is we've done every other horse, and and we kind of run through the whole day like that, and mixed in with that, like I will do the piece on groundwork. I do a lot of groundwork with my young horses, so uh, that's something that I did last year when I was working with Willie in Texas, and when I was with Scott and Willie up in the uh, New England area, I also did a little piece about the groundwork that I do, and so uh, I'm hoping to get that in there as well, and then Scott will probably do a, con- um, a talk about confirmation. So we, we do some other topics besides just the uh, under saddle portion of it, if you want to say that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's so important because that's, that's really, I think where people get nervous or, or they don't know, you know, they, you yeah. know, they think, okay, I, you know, I've got my horse doing this and we've gone to the breed shows and it's gone well, but then there's a whole lot of information that you need to teach that horse. And, and it's important information. Cause if you mess up there, ugh, it, it's harder to fix it later, yeah, later yeah, as you go. Yeah. It's, it's really important. It's sort of like that kindergarten kid, first grade age. Like it's really important. You have to learn multiple things when you do that. So yeah. it's fun. Yeah. So I, I know you guys are going to do a phenomenal job doing that. So just as a basic, just for, for our discussion, you know, what do you expect sort of a three-year-old in October to be doing? What, what are your expectations? Well, it's, it, I think it depends a little bit on like how long have they been under saddle, you know, for various reasons, somebody might've started it early in the year. Other re- other people might've started it in the middle of the summer. So a three-year-old in October might be a different 
levels of training. But I think in general, for me, it's pretty basic with a three-year-old. I'm doing walk trot canter. I am going down long side and doing simple figures. You know, it's it's very, very basic. What I like to do with our three-year-olds here, on top of what they do in the ring, is doing a lot of variety. So whether that's cavaletti, free jumping, going outside, trail riding, galloping on a track. I know it has to be enough exciting things that they're excited to go to work. Um, I, I know myself, if I'm just doing circles in the indoor, I will get bored eventually. So <laughs> I can't imagine how it is with a three-year-old. So I, I try to keep variety in their work. And with, with every three-year-old, I mean, it probably goes with four and five-year-olds too. You have to watch a little bit how they develop mentally and physically. So you have to take those two pieces under under consideration as well. How much do I work my three-year-old? Is it four times a week where I ride them for 15 minutes each time? Or is it three times a week and I work them 20, 30 minutes? And it all depends on each horse because they're all, they're all so different. Yeah, mm-hmm. some, some can have similarities depending on bloodlines and stuff like that. But you really have to look at each individual, I feel, and, and make a judgment call on what you feel is the appropriate thing for them at that stage in their life. I think then that, that draws attention to, you know, programs like this for young horses that, that help to get experts out to different parts of the country and to, you know, gain expertise. I mean, that's part part of the problem in such a big country like Canada or, or the U.S. in which, like, you have lots of experts, but they're sort of regionalized, right? And so I think the uh-huh. USDF is doing a great job of, of sending you guys to different areas and different places and, and getting that experience out there because... Uh, I think, you know, in Europe and in the, you know, in the, in the small countries, you know, you can, you can get that expertise by driving two hours down the road or, or, you know, yeah, yeah. everybody knows somebody who does young horses, but I think it's really difficult in these other areas where you have made, you're a breeder and maybe you have a, a nice young horse that you've bred, but the, the best young horse trainer for you will be 10 hours drive. That's not really realistic. And, you know, and so, um, I think, Part of the idea of the program is to create more experts in all areas of the country. Yeah, for sure. It, it's it, it's hard for those breeders that are in the middle of nowhere yeah. and and don't have access, like you said, to to a good young horse trainer, or even some young horse trainers that maybe they take on horses, but they don't get regular help, or they're they're looking to make that next step. Uh, you know, they're they've been doing great with one part of the process and now they need to need a little more education and where to go from there. So, uh, yeah, we really try to hit every part of the country as we can. You know, it's it, like you said, it's a very large country and, and it's hard to be able to hit every little nook and make sure everybody finds an opportunity to uh, be part of it. But I think, yeah, sorry, I was just going to say that then, then, I mean, if you're within a few hours of of where you're going in Oregon, I think it's just really important that people make an effort to to uh, to go and to see and experience these forums because, OK, maybe you don't have a three year old this year. But if you're if you're a dressage trainer or you're a horse trainer, you're going to have one eventually. And, you know, you need these you know, ideas and take advantage of these uh, experts going around to the country. And, and uh, I think I would really encourage people to go and and uh and get some knowledge if not for now for later in, you know in your uh in your life and train in training horses and and eventually we all get a young horse that we don't exactly know what to do with it so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah no exactly I, love- I, I think it's a great opportunity both for not even just trainers but like you said it's breeders and maybe you somebody has a yearling or two-year-old out there in the field that that's you know, eventually it will be three years old and it will need to be started. So, yeah, no, I think it's a it's a great opportunity to come out and, and see the forum, um, even if you don't have a horse at the moment. You know, if you're thinking about or you, you have one out in the field that is uh, even just a weanling at the moment, yeah. uh, it's a great, great chance to get some good information. So. Well, and I'm well, sure I think you- these, yeah, these things are also really good to go to see because you never know what a three-year-old is going to do. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like the these other other clinics, you know, you're gonna see <laughs> um, St. George horses, some fancy dressage horses. <laughs> you basically know what you're gonna get. You're, you're gonna get right. But always, Isn't you know. that the NASCAR mentality, Phil? Yeah, I think it's, it's like yeah, a little <laughs> NASCAR. Well, I was more thinking I was gonna be constructive, Phil, and okay. say you know it is nice. You know it is true when you have it. Even you guys would be available, I'm sure, for questions. And you know what should your yearling be doing, or what can you do with the yearling? Yeah. I'm sure those are also a great time to to grab. Both of you guys are are wonderful and such great have such great knowledge. You know, ask those questions on what should it proper. What should a yearling do? What can you do with that horse? How do you make it a nice citizen? And and that's really yeah, I totally agree. If you have any young horse, you should be going to this clinic. So uh, yeah, for sure. Well, Michael. So how can people find more information online on how to get tickets and register for the program? I think the auditor registration is still open, I believe, and it's uh, through the USCF website. And uh, I believe that's currently the only way to sign up for auditing. Great. I you're think you can sign up on site too, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah, there's a great, uh, actually a great page on the website uh, under the USCF Sport Horse Development Forum. Uh, there's a great page that has all the information uh, on there. It's October 20th through 21st uh, in Sherwood, Oregon. So, Michael, we can't wait to hear how it goes. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. And I hope you have a safe travels out to Oregon. Me too. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on again. We appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for, again for having me. Well, Phil, for our total saddle fit at the tip of the week, I'm so excited. We have Olivia Logoy Welts, but we always want to tell you guys about the total saddle fit girths. We love them. So, Phil, which girth are we talking about and highlighting today? We're going to highlight the synthetic version of the shoulder relief girth, which we like. Um, I, I think the stretch tech is our favorite girth, but, you know, it's sometimes the, the price point, it might be a little bit high for your you know, weekend warrior rider or, you know, so the budget friendly synthetic girth is great for a lot of horses. We have it. I use it on a Frisian yeah. horse. Yeah, um, I do too. I was just going to say I use it on my Frisian and it works <laughs> the best on him. I, yeah, I, again, I, I like the, you know, I, the stretch tech, I, my, my warm bloods seem to go in, but my Frisians have mm -hmm. loved this girth. I have used it on all my Frisians and there's something about it. I don't know uh, the shape. Yeah, I think maybe it might really fit the, the, the rounder shape a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just like, I mean, the shape of it, you know, is just that shoulder relief freedom and, and, but it helps the saddles fit. The horse is better on the, the rounder guys where the saddle yep. might shift. That's why I switched him over to it. Yeah, it's it's fantastic girth, fantastic fantastic product. Really easy care with the, with the synthetic girth. It's antimicrobial, and you could just hose that thing right off and hang it yes. out to dry, and, and it'll be ready to use the next day. So um, love it. Big big fans of all the products uh, from Total Saddle Fit, and Justin is great about answering questions. Just go on totalsaddlefit.com. To, to find out more information and all the great products will be will be right there. And something else we don't talk about very often is he has a complete line of saddle pads too. So you can find those over there as well. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. Well, it is truly our pleasure to have Olivia Lagoy Welch. She's been such a great team player for us here on the Dressage Radio Show, and she was the alternate, the fabulous alternate at the World Equestrian Games. Olivia, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. It's great to be back. I bet you have been on the road, girl. I can barely keep up with you. You have been everywhere, haven't you? It, it has been a very long summer. I, I will say that for sure. I think in total, I've been gone about five months, which it kind of snuck up on me, but it's so good to be home. Oh my gosh. I love it. So, so tell us about your five months. I mean, that's incredible. What, what do you, obviously we know what you've been up to, but tell us a little bit about the, the whole, the whole plan. What happened? So after the Florida season, um, basically they named the, the short list for the team, which was, I think, the, the top eight uh, athletes in the country. And then uh, we went over to Europe to proceed with the rest of the qualifying procedures, which was 
Rotterdam and Aachen, and there was one show in between uh, that was optional, I believe. And and so that started in mid June, I guess. And then Aachen was in July, and then getting home, and then. I ended up going to Florida to stay close to the team when they named me alternate. And then from there, we went to Tryon where we had a base camp and then Tryon happened and we ended up getting asked to do the test ride for the, for the show, which was really cool. So we actually did end up riding at way and we did the Grand Prix and um, actually had a great go of it. So that was very rewarding. But so like that was the the timeline. And then fortunately, Lona got to get on a truck that day and and go home. So but that that kind of like led us from I went a little bit early to Europe, like mid-May to get a little bit more settled in. And and so we, you know, we left around May 15th and he got back around September 15th. So it was wow. it It was a long summer. Yes, it was. It was. So, um, you know, Lono now is a pretty good traveler, I would think. He's he's done this a few times now. He's quite a good traveler, and he, he's always quite the pest when he gets home because he's spent the last <laughs> five months being basically like the the only child and having my, <laughs> my undivided attention the whole time. I don't take a groom except for the shows, so he has me personally doting on him and obsessing about him basically 24 seven for five months. So he's, he's a bit of a holy terror when he gets home, <laughs> but he's, he's learning. There's a barn full of horses. I have to ride now again. Mm, back to, back to reality. Back, back not to that reality. You, weren't wor- for, you were working. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. We're out of the bubble, so to speak, but he's very happy to be home and in his turnout and eating grass every morning and walking the hills and that kind of stuff. So, so tell Olivia, me. sorry, I was just going to ask you, do you find it a fitness challenge to go from, you know, sort of five months of riding one horse to going home where you're now, like you said, riding a stable full? Is, is that a fitness uh, challenge a, a or were you bit. doing things? That, 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 yeah. <laughs> that first week is a little bit painful or so. You're kind of like, wow, another one? Like my butt sore. Like, yeah. um, and, and it can be actually hard in reverse as well, like going from riding all the horses to then like going to basically riding, you know, one, maybe two horses a day. When I spend time with Egbert in Holland, you know, he'll often put me to work and put me on one or two others a day. So at least then it's not just your own horse that you're riding. But for the majority of us, when we're really in that base camp, unless you've brought multiple horses yourself, you're riding you know, one horse a day and, and then you have to try and stay fit. Otherwise, like Casey and Adrian were very good about going to the gym every day. Laura doesn't do that. And I I'll admit that like, I also didn't do that. We do do all the work around the barn ourselves. So like we're mucking stalls and walking horses and that kind of stuff. So it's not that we're just only sitting, sitting around, but you can get a little agitated and yeah, well, what do you do with all that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what, it's you know, in the bubble. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do laundry, obsess, watch your video 50,000 times. Actually, you try really hard not to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. What else do we do? We watch our horses and turn out. It is, it is an art. I've learned to pack a hammock in my trunk. It's one of the things <gasps> that goes with me to, like, horse shows when we travel internationally and stuff just because at some of the big shows there's really like kind of no place to like get comfortable or yeah. you know it packed in a tiny little bag and you know you try and I try and read a lot and then you know keep up with people at home and that kind of stuff and watch what else is going on I think that's a big thing that we do is you know watch everyone else do their training sessions and, you know, be supportive of one another. And so that takes up at least most of the morning and then your horse goes and turn out in the afternoon and you just kind of, I don't know, find ways to use up the time. Yeah. But it's, it's definitely a huge comparison, like huge difference to like here, you know, like where you usually start with the first horse around eight or nine in the morning. And depending on whether I have my, like, you know, like clients that work at night, I'll be done somewhere between like five thirty and eight, you know, at night. So yeah. that's pretty different. 
Yeah, no, yeah. it's really different for you. You're you're busy, really busy here in the yeah. states. So, you know, and you run a farm, you have a farm, you know, you're just going all the time. So, I'm sure when you're sort of in the bubble, you know, that that can be a bit of a challenge for sure. So, you know, again, how was the European tour overall? Did you, did you feel like that was really successful this year? Um, I think it was pretty good. I think you always come away like learning a lot of stuff um Rotterdam for us was okay like I wouldn't say it was our most amazing show but it also wasn't a disaster we at that show got a little bit unlucky on the draws and ended up like I think second in the arena the first day and and possibly the second day or first in the arena the second day something like that so the scoring was maybe a little bit tough there um but I was overall like pretty happy with the performance, more happy with the special. He was quite on the edge in the special in the main stadium. And um, I was really, really happy with it. And I think that he and I, I guess both of us together are like, feel like going through this sort of transition or hopefully like growth phase of like, you know, things like say his changes have always been a bit swingy in the Grand Prix. And that's been a challenging and like, they're getting like much, much straighter now all of a sudden. And, you know, then it's, it's getting everything that he can do well, that it's like trying to get it to happen all in one test. And that's kind of like where we at. So that, you know, that show wasn't a bad one. You know, it's, it's a fun show. It's a big show. It's a really intense show coming from the States because especially on Saturdays, like the big stadium is full and with a partying sort of busier crowd that, global can be intense at night Friday night lights for sure but then like kind of like put yourself think more like WEF and WEF with like higher higher stadium seating and it's you know it's different for the horses that are you know electric or hot so we were definitely on the edge in that and uh and but held it together so well so like I, that that was pretty exciting and you know, we ended up doing the smaller show in between Rotterdam and Aachen called Luda Lounge. And that, I have to say, was not a great decision for us. Um, I think because our scores weren't that high at Rotterdam or weren't as high as he had been scoring or can score, we opted to do that show. And that just wasn't the right choice for him. It wasn't kind of his kind of venue I learned in that moment that like he is kind of like I do the big shows and those are the (laughs) shows that I do it was kind of like a much smaller show with not a lot of atmosphere and um, it you know it was lovely and that they did like a good job like trying to organize it and that kind of thing but the warm-up was like literally above the competition ring And so you walk down this hill to be in the competition ring and could sort of see the horses up above you in the warm up. And so I actually like he I got through the Grand Prix and it was it was good. It was a clean test. It was okay, but it just wasn't like our best because he's kind of like, why are we doing the Grand Prix in the backyard? And then the (laughs) second day he actually like. I don't know what got to him or something bugged him, but I actually ended up needing to excuse myself from that test in the special. And I, it occurred to me later that like the only other time that I've ever had to do that with him was at dressage at Lexington when we were in the main outside ring and like the warm ups and the other competition rings were like above him and like horses and golf carts were coming down the hill. I don't know if it was related, but like that wasn't our best show. And definitely not how you want to go into Aachen. And yeah, so, a, yeah. Kind of not a confidence builder right. that it was right. supposed no. to be. Not a confidence builder no. and not something that I had ever experienced with him, uh. at least not in a very long time. Like he, you know, he definitely was a tricky horse as a younger horse, but has gotten to be quite a good competition horse. And so going into Aachen, it was kind of like, oh my God. But Aachen yeah. turned out to be really you know quite a good show for us like the Grand Prix was a little like that place where you're like okay you know what's going to happen when we go in there and and it was good I think it was also mistake free you know it can be a little bit like there's still so much more in there that like I feel like I just need to get it organized and tap into it better so we ended up actually tying with Stefan for fifth 
in the four star CDI. And then I had opted to do the, the freestyle and that I didn't realize the freestyle was under lights at Aachen when I signed up for it. Somehow I had like misremembered the four star freestyle being like, you know, at like 5 p.m. And so it was like a mostly packed stadium. And I think awesome. my ride time was like 10, 10 p.m. or something like that. <laughs> after and, your bedtime. Um, yeah, you're like, wait a minute. After my bedtime, for yep. sure. And um, but he was really, really good. And we had like a great go. And I think we got like a... 77 percent or something and uh i think we ended up third in that yeah Yeah, we did the whole the whole team had a really good show at at auckland didn't didn't they yeah yeah well yeah i think i think most everyone had a a really great go of it well i I say that diddy got distracted by the camera we had some amazing highs and a few lows yes that's right stefan didn't have the greatest go either you know, with either of his, I think the atmosphere got to both of those horses a little bit. And I think also just trying to like, for me, it's a, just a big takeaway of like, okay, like no matter what scores you get, two shows is enough. Like, you know, you need yeah. to just like That's sit on that and not, yeah. yeah, not change your plan and that kind of thing. And that he is now like, he needs a, like a bigger venue is more his type of thing for some reason like that he he's like has to be for real in his little in his yeah. brain or something like that yeah. which is, <laughs> is kind of funny but but yeah so that that was kind of like a very fast version of the of the european tour and wow. uh yeah wow yeah so, and i think everyone so had that and, like and lots you of great experience I mean, and if you learn yeah. even if the, all the choices weren't perfect you learn things right moving forward Absolutely. Like, and that's just, you know, the culmination of experiences, basically. I always say too, like, I'm a learn by doing kind of person. Like I'm always <laughs> looking to learn new stuff and asking questions and examining it and trying to make all the right decisions. And you, sometimes you just don't know until you know, you know, yeah. like every yeah. choice you make, you make it with the best of intentions. And sometimes you don't sure. know what the outcome is going to be. And only once you've experienced that, do you know how to plan better for the next time? Well, so, I think- uh, uh, sorry, I was just going to ask another question um, about like which which do you think you're learning more by going to Europe? Are you learning more riding or more? Uh, you know, you've been talking about working on your eye for for you know watching the Grand Prix and watching tons of Grand Prix horses. I think a little bit of both. I think you know the piece about watching that standard, right? Like if you think about it, everyone that's going over on those trips. We are, you know, at this given point in time, the big fish in the States. You know, we are the top eight competitors. You go to global, you know, everyone there is always in the top three and winning stuff. And same with Stefan on that coast. And we go over there and you're, you know, duking it out to be, you know, up there. Like Laura's obviously cemented her spot, you know, in that high ranking. The rest of us are working on getting there. And I think seeing, you know, continuing to see the standard and being around it, it's not that we're not always striving for excellence ourselves, but when you're put up against, you know, like Sonic and like all the other horses that you're working on, on beating, like you're riding against like Isabel Wirth and Edward Gall and like people who have been doing this for years and do it very, very well. I think you just learn a lot just by being around them and seeing that and seeing the power and the throughness and like how they handle good days and how they handle bad days and that kind of stuff. And I think for me personally, like where I'm at, like in the riding is just like also learning how to like, you know, you work so hard to get to Grand Prix and you think like, Oh my God, like, yay. Like I've gotten to Grand Prix. I've made it. And then it's like, okay, well, then you got to get it to international Grand Prix. Okay. I've gotten it to international Grand Prix. (laughs) Like, yay. Like I'm scoring high 60s, 70s. Okay. I'm scoring 70, 71, 72. Okay. How do you break that like 70 to 73 barrier and become like, okay, it's a consistent 74, 75, 76, you know, number one, does your horse have the scope? um you know to do that and then like where you know what is the difference like you know what are where are the details and part of it is being 
just good and consistent and being out there and them a bit deciding like, you know, yes, yes, it's good. Like I have some judges, like when we did the test ride, for instance, I got the score sheets back and I know a few of the judges who have judged this horse before and seen him go, well, that was a very good test for him. And they were ready to reward that with good points because they view that horse as being capable of it. And so if he does something good, they're willing to give him an eight, five or a nine or a, you know, eight or whatever it is, or a seven, five on his ones now, because they're so much better than they were. Whereas say like some of the judges that you don't see ever or as much, you know, they're kind of like, well, that was nice, you know, and everything is a seven, seven something because they haven't seen it. And I know it's supposed to be just that day, but there is a reality of this is kind of, it's also just human nature. I don't think they do it on purpose, but you get to just get more comfortable with a horse. And, you know, I don't want to say know what to expect, but if they do something good, you get more comfortable to reward it more so. So I think that's, you know, that's a big piece of it. And yeah, yeah. I don't know. Did I answer the question? Absolutely. And I think that makes total sense to that there, I think you can apply that too. And that's kind of what I've been listening and and applying, you know, you can apply what you're saying to whatever championship level you're trying to go to, you know, now we're all going to regionals and national levels and, and it's the same thing, you know, you, you listen to, okay, I wouldn't make these decisions, but I made them like this at the time. And I think that's what you have to do. And, and how do you strive to the next level of whatever level you're doing. So I think it's really cool to sort of listen to what you're saying and, and even think of it as you're applying it to, to whatever you're doing this time of year uh, is pretty cool. And, um, you know, to hear th- that the top riders are doing that all the time, it doesn't go away, <laughs> which I think is really cool to hear, hear you say. Yeah, I think, I don't know, like, I, at least the way I view it as, like, I feel like you, like, the riding and, like, trying to get good at this. And like you said, no matter what level, it's so much about, like, personal examination and being responsible for, like, what you're doing and what you need to do better and this and that. Because the horse didn't get up and be like, you know what, today I am going <laughs> to win, like, the second level championships or I'm going to go win the Olympics or I'm going to, you know, it's like us that's asked them to do this and, like, we have a huge like influence on them. So you kind of have to always be like, okay, how can I make this better? How can I improve my whole program? You know, I'm also always looking at that for like, you know, like the farm and the barn and like, you know, our feeding programs and our exercise programs and our vet care and our shoeing. Like it's all such like saddle fit. It all really plays into it. Like who I bring in as clinicians to support me and to support, you know, my students and that kind of stuff you know, what's, what's the best mix that creates the best combination for both, you know, like, like physically being in the right place, but also mentally being in the right place. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. So, so real quick, Olivia, what's the next stage? Where, what are you and Lono doing now? Well, we're just sort of starting to, I, I don't want to say like kick it back up again, but like after WEG, I was like, okay, you need a break. But like my, but he's also like, such an interesting shaped horse. He's sort of confirmationally <laughs> unique. I also knew he really needed to not get unfit. So he's just been kind of like playfully lunging on loose side reins for the last probably since WAG basically. And so now we're just starting to, you know, like start to go back to work again. And he seems actually in quite good spirits. I've got one of my uh, favorite trainer mentors from the West Coast here, Dr. Tina Stewart. And so she's clinicking with us uh, this week. And that's exciting and also nice for me to have just some eyes to help guide me as we go back. And she was also at WEG and watched and was there to, you know, she's like, well, I have some ideas and some thoughts and that kind of thing. So that's, that's really cool. And I got to get to work on our new freestyle for next year. Awesome. Um, I've been sort of trying to do that all year and haven't gotten to it. So we'll, uh, that'll be what we'll be focusing on and maybe we'll head towards some world cup stuff and just see what happens. It should be of a, a less intense year. I think so. Even if there is another little tour in his future, hopefully it'll be a nice succinct, like four to six weeks. And, uh, then we can spend a lot more time at home next year. 
I love it. I love it. Well, fantastic. Well, how can our listeners find you online if they have any questions or want to come meet you at your beautiful farm? We are at mountaincrestfarm.com or Facebook. You can look for just my name or Mountain Crest Farm uh, on Facebook. Or I think I still have Live Dressage or Olivia at Live Dressage or something like that. Any of those things work. Awesome. (laughs) Well, Olivia, thanks so much for sharing and taking time to be with us. It's so fun to hear you guys. uh, You know, we're your biggest fan and we love hearing how you guys are developing. Thank you so much. It's been a fun journey to be on sort of throughout the process. So, Love it. Thanks, Olivia. All right. Bye. Well, always, we love email and Facebook shout outs. Keep them coming and uh, we'll queue them up and, and when we'll, we really, really try to get to everybody's uh, question and comments. So thanks so much for that as always. And the United States Dressage Federation is your connection to dressage education, competition, and achievement. Visit usdf.org for more information. That's www.usdf.org, the online destination for dressage. As always, you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com, and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. I think the best way to find me is through Facebook, or my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors for allowing us to put on a good show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we'll talk to you next week. (laughs) 